at chapter 43. The title of my message tonight is God will make a way. God will make a way. Notice that the Lord's had me delivering really a series of messages that are similar. And honestly, I didn't know why until maybe about 30 minutes ago. <laughs> uh, but the Lord helped me to see that these messages are really designed to eradicate any and all strongholds of doubt that you may be struggling with. It's kind of like when you go to the carnival and anybody ever play that game where you got the ball and your goal is to knock down all the clowns? You know, you knock one down and then you knock the next one down, you knock the next one down. Well, that's really what we've been doing. One week we've looked at, you know, dealing with the doubt that God was able to do what he promised he was going to do in my life. The next time we looked at, well, do I have the strength to make it? We talked about you can make it. We looked at uh, dealing with the doubt that comes when things seem to be delayed. You, you're, you're tempted to believe that this delay means defeat. That is never going to happen. And uh, last week we dealt with those times where it looks like we lost. That is too late. And how do I handle that? And, um, and so the Lord's really been helping us to just kind of deal with all these different questions, all these different challenges that we could deal with when we're chasing the dream God's put in our heart. And tonight, I want to end this by uh, just reminding you about something that we're all very familiar with. And to help you with that, I just want to share a story. About a year or two ago, uh, my family and another family went to uh, one of the apple orchards here in Michigan, and they had a maze. And this wasn't the first time we had gone to the maze. We'd gone maybe a couple years in a row. But this year, we went a little too late in the season. And so when we were going through the maze, the kids were leading us this time. And, you know, there are clearly ways that you're supposed to go through the maze. You can see where people have walked through the maze. But the kids noticed that, you know, the corn stalks, whatever it was, it wasn't as thick as it was any, as, it, as it had been, and that you could actually kind of just kind of slip through them and create your own way. So instead of us following the maze like we should, they started making their own way through the maze. And eventually we got out real fast, you know, and they were real excited about it. And, you know, uh, at times in life, we find ourselves in situations like a maze. You know, where we're just going along, believing God, and we seem to hit a dead end. We seem to hit a roadblock. Uh, there are some obstacles in the way. And for you to actually have the victory that God wants you to have, he's going to have to make a way. He, he's going to have to not follow the natural course of things, not follow the rules as we think of them, but instead just create his own way through this. Make a way so that you actually have the victory that he promised you. And it's in times like this, times where, where we, we are facing, uh, where it seems to be no, no way, that we got to believe that God can make a way. That we, we've got to take the position that where there is no way, God will make a way. And, and so the message that I'm, I'm tasked to share with you tonight is going to help you to do that, to believe your way to victory. And so let's start in Isaiah chapter 43. In verse 18, it reads, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. And he's talking about a miracle, which is a divine intervention in the ordinary course of things. In other words, things normally go this way, but when God shows up, something happens that doesn't normally happen. Amen. Something that happens that often will contradict or override nature, in a sense. He says, now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The word make here means to put to tread down, the word way here means a road or a highway. 
So I remember uh, Bishop had talked about when Word of Faith first bought our 10-mile building and how the building was really right in front of what is now 696. And I remember living in that building or living there because our house was right next to the church. And I remember every day coming outside and seeing them working on 696. Now, I didn't understand very much what, what was going on. I think I was like six years old. But of course, in the hindsight, I'm like, man, that, that, that I remember they're not being much there at all. And yet they went ahead and, and created a way in the wilderness. You know, they just put down a highway right in the middle of what used to be just trees and, and small roads and things like that. And that's what God's talking about. He's saying, I'm the kind of guy that'll look at a wilderness and then put down a highway right in the middle of it. <laughs> I'll put a 696 right in the middle of this, the, of this roadblock that you were facing. I will make a way. Now, maybe the best example of this is what he did with Israel. If you remember the story in Exodus chapter 14, God got them out of Egypt, but they found themselves up against the Red Sea. Pharaoh had changed his mind. His army has come to take them back. They are trapped. They're panicking. But God gives Moses instruction, says, lift up your rod, split the sea. Moses does what God says, and God literally creates a road in the middle of a sea. And his people walked through that road. And we know what happened to Pharaoh when they tried to follow him. God made a way where there was no way. And so we can see that God does this. That God performs miracles for his people. Go to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. Verse 25. This is a familiar opening of scripture for many Christians. But let's look at it from a different perspective. It says, And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse. Notice this woman's position, the situation that she's in. She's had this issue for 12 years. That's a long time. I have a 12-year-old. I hardly remember what life was like before my 12-year-old came along. Can you imagine being sick with an issue of blood for 12 years? Can you imagine the amount of doctors she had gone to, the amount of treatments that she had gone through? And that's what this is telling us here. It's telling us she suffered many things. Those treatments were not pleasant of many physicians. And yet, instead of getting better, she was worse. And God loved her. So how did God deal with her impossible situation? How did God make a way when there was no way? Clearly the doctors could not fix this. When she had heard of Jesus, what she hear? He's a healer. There's another doctor in the house. His name is Dr. Jesus. She came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, we know the Amplified says, she kept saying, and she did this in faith. If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway, immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Notice there was no way for this woman to be healed, but God made a way. God made sure this woman heard about Jesus. See, a lot of times we look at this and we think of some other sides of it, but you've got to realize that God's the one initiating this thing. God is the one who saw this woman being in this state and he made sure she heard about Jesus and he made sure that he, Jesus came close enough that she could get to him. And when she did, she was healed. There was no way, but God made a way. When the doctor said no, God said yes. Go to Acts chapter 12. He performs miracles. I said, he performs miracles. Anybody glad he performs miracles? Acts chapter 12, verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. So he is persecuting the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. This just got real serious. 
because James was one of those that traveled with Jesus, you would think those guys would be invincible. But Herod, of course, is the king, and he has the power of the state at his disposal. I mean, you notice how it said he stretched forth his hands. Well, you know, he was, it was his hands uh, uh, symbolically, but he was using the hands of soldiers physically. You understand what I'm trying to say here? And so he gets James and kills him. And now, verse 3 says, because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Let's go ahead and kill the king, or the leader of the, of the, of the group. That's what he's thinking. Then were the days of unleavened bread, and when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. So notice that when Herod decided to get Peter, there was no escaping. There was no escaping. He was able to get a hold of Peter. And then what's really interesting was that he assigned 16 soldiers to look after the preacher. 16 soldiers. And you better have 16 soldiers come after one. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, here's a real, a real bad situation. I mean, Peter's about to die in a matter of a couple of days. And what, what are you really going to do about it? Just in the natural, what can you do? You, you're not going to overcome 16 soldiers. You're not going to overcome all the power of the state and get him out. There will be no prison break here. You need a miracle. There is no way for Peter to be delivered. But of course, we know God is the God who will make a way. Amen. Verse 5, so Peter therefore was kept in prison. But prayer, there you go, that's a big key, was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. What are they doing? They're believing for a miracle. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night. I don't know why God always seems to wait to the last minute. <laughs> Anybody ever notice that? It's just, you know, Lord, could you have done this last week when I was trying my best not to scream at the top of my lungs <laughs> but he does show up on time the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and the keepers before the door kept the prison that's four soldiers right there and behold the angel of the Lord prayer brings angels came upon him a light shined in the prison and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up saying arise up quickly and his chains fell off from his hands mm. And the angel said to him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him. And wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second war, or the guard, is what that means, they came unto the iron gate they leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. So notice an angel shows up in the prison, there's a bright light, but clearly this was a, 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 a spiritual light because the soldiers didn't see it. Even Peter didn't see it. He wakes Peter up, get up, put your clothes on, put your shoes on. It's like talking to your five-year-old. Put your coat on. He finally gets him to walk out the prison and what's really interesting is what happened to the guards? There were two soldiers sitting there. There were two guards at the door. There were two wards or two different guards that they went through. I don't know if they, they, they did, you know, some little secret agent stuff or if they just walked straight out and they couldn't see them. But somehow or another, they were able to walk past all of them. And then, of course, they come to a gate. And the gate, usually those gates are pretty big. The gate just opens like it's 2015 and you press the button. Come on now. Like you just walked into the mall. I mean, the gate opens. And they go walking into the city. There were chains, there were soldiers, there was a prison, there was a gate. All these things were obstacles, but God jumped in the middle of a situation where there was no way and God made a way because he performs miracles for his people. Go to Matthew chapter 1. Reminds me of when Israel faced the walls of Jericho. Those walls, history tells us, were so thick you could run chariot races on them. There was no way you were getting into Jericho. It wasn't going to happen. But God says march around this place for seven days. Once a day for six days on the seventh day, walk, march on the seven, seven times on the seventh day, and then shout. And when they did that, God knocked that wall down, people walked on in, got their victory. You know, once again, there was no way, but God made a way. I don't know 
who is dealing with one of those one of these situations. But I'm here to tell you, God is he's he's taken over this service to tell you that he will make a way. You may not there may not be a way, but he will make a way. He will drop a 696 right in the middle of your situation. He will knock your wall down flat. He will cause your chains to fall off and your gates to swing open. He will make a way. I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen tonight. Because he can do it. And he wants to. Matthew chapter 1. Of course, we're here in the Christmas season. I don't know if there's a better example of this than this story. Verse 22, now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin, that's a key phrase there, shall be with child. I just I couldn't help but notice when I was reading that, that the Bible calls a pregnant woman with child, not massive cells, not fetus, but the Bible calls them with child. Thank you for those amens and those that can't say amen, we're going to pray for you. And shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. In other words, this son is going to be God. Of course, we know Isaiah 9, 6, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Jesus said it himself, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? So then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife and, they, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. Now, of course, what was very, very interesting about this story more than any other story was that a virgin gave birth. Amen. This goes against nature. We know nature teaches us that there's got to be a man and there's got to be a woman for there to be a baby. And I'm not going to get into the birds and the bees tonight. <laughs> yeah, your mama didn't teach you that. Society did. So anyway. <laughs> right? I mean, this is so, so, but God does this obviously in a very different way. Why? Because God found himself in a situation where there was no way to save his creation. We know that Adam sinned and that when he sinned, he was separated from God and his nature changed. He took on the nature of Satan. Amen. The Bible says this way in Romans chapter 5 that when man sinned, death came. Amen. So because sin was, was, was committed, death or spiritual death, separation from God and having a nature of the devil became, uh, came on to Adam and the Bible says it passed on all men. So everybody play, everybody who was now born into the earth had the nature of death. Everybody who was born into the earth was a slave now to Satan. The Bible says in Romans 5 that death now reigned. We know that really you can call him king death. Satan reigned over the earth. He reigned over men. That's why there was so much suffering, because and even to this day, because he steals, he kills, and he destroys. That's what he does. I, we'll look at this later, but there's a, a, an instance in Jesus' ministry where a boy was possessed with a demon spirit, and how the father was saying that the demon spirit keeps throwing him into the fire and keeps throwing him into the water to destroy him. And that's what Satan's all about. Amen. You know, that you, you think a demon spirit has a, a hold of a person that he'd be satisfied. But no, Satan's all about destroying people. And so that's what he's been doing, and that's what God saw him doing. And there was really no way, no way for God to deliver his creation from his enemy. Amen. We've done an illustration before. Let me see if I can use a couple guys right here. Can I use you three just for a moment? And I'm going to use you as well. I'll use all four of you. We've done this before, but it's worth looking at. And so I've got Adam. Go ahead and turn around and face the audience if you would. And then I've got Adam's great-great-grandson. And then I got his great-great-great-great-grandson. All right? And I'm just going to have you just step out for a moment here. So here's the problem. Adam sins, and now 
he is spiritually dead and he carries with him sin. Right? So even though, you know, this is his great, great grandson was passed on down from Adam to his son and grandson and on and on is the same sin, that same nature of death. So Adam was a slave to, to Satan and he's a slave to Satan. And what's passed down from him is the same thing so that he's a slave to Satan. So all of these individuals are slave to Satan, which is why you can't say, well, you know, uh, uh, Muhammad's going to save me. Why? Because he's a slave. A, sl a slave can't slave a slave. They're all, they're all slaves. Or whatever other individual you can come up with, none of these individuals can save you. The only way that slaves can be set free is if somebody comes in who is not a slave to sin and sets them free. His name is Jesus. <laughs> Thank you all very much. So go to Hebrews chapter 4 for a moment. Did Jesus qualify? Did he have the spiritual disease called sin? No. no. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says this. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Amen. Jesus never sinned. Amen. Why not? Well, part of it, because it's a deep subject, but part of it was that that sin, that, 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 sin, that spiritual disease called sin, Amen. was passed on through men. Amen. It came from Adam to Adam's son, to Adam's grandson, to Adam's great-grandson. It came, went from men to men to men. So what God did was he took men out the equation. Amen. And God said, I'll step in and be the father. And so God, of course, didn't have that sin nature. Didn't have that spiritual disease called sin. Instead of having the nature of Satan, Jesus had the nature of God. And he was perfectly positioned to now come in and be the savior of the world. So God, there was no way to save us, but God just made a way. You know what I'm going to do? I know the laws of nature say that for there to be a baby, there's got to be a daddy and a mama. You know what I'm going to do? It's just going to be a mama, and I'm going to be the daddy so I can say it in. Aren't you glad that God can change the rules a little bit like that? It's not even changing the rules. He's so brilliant that he knows that there's a way to do that. Yeah, man, he, he made a way so that he could save the race of slaves called humans. And I'm so glad that he did. And that's really what, what, what this time is all about. It's all about thanking God that he sent us his son. He would be, and you saw this throughout the Old Testament, that you, you'd see the lamb without blemish. He would be the lamb without blemish that would die and take on the sins of us all so we could be free. When there was no way, God made a way. And now we all have that. Those that have chosen to follow Jesus... We are free from sin. We don't have the nature of Satan anymore. We, are, we have the nature of God. We are children of God. We have the, uh, the God living in us. Because God made a way. That's the amazing future that we're experiencing. God's future for us. All right, go to Mark chapter 9. He performs miracles. He performs miracles. He might be looking about, thinking about this and going, well, you know, I've messed up since I've known Jesus. I blew it. That's why I'm in this situation. That's why there is no way for God to do what he said he's going to do. Let me remind you of a guy by the name of Samson. You want to talk about a guy who was a mess up? Samson was the king of all mess ups. I mean, how is it that you are anointed of God? An angel showed up when, when you were, before you were even born, and told your mother that you were going to be the one that launches the deliverance of Israel from the Philistines. And you, 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 you come into this world, and you have supernatural strength. 
You're defeating a thousand guys with the jawbone of a donkey. You're ripping apart lions with your bare hands. I don't know about you, but I would call, I would consider that to be cool. I would think, man, I am the most blessed guy on the earth. I am not messing this up. Come on, that's better than Rambo. That's better than the Terminator. That's better than one of the Avengers, man. Wow. But he had a woman problem. Today we might say he have a zipper problem. So he just keeps sleeping around with folk. And it finally catches up to him. Sometimes with, with things like that, God will give you time. I mean, there's about a woman in Revelation chapter 3 that Jesus spoke about that was teaching God's people that it was okay to fornicate, a false prophetess. And Jesus said, I gave her time to repent. So God will give you time because he loves you and he wants to give you every chance, every chance that you can have to turn around before judgment comes. But at some point, judgment comes. And so in his case, you know, he finally just really blew it. And the Philistines get a hold of him. He doesn't have his strength anymore. They take out his eyes. They all get in this huge facility like this right now. It just all seems to be all the leaders of the Philistines. And they bring him out so they can laugh at him. But God had said that he was going to be the one that launched the deliverance of the Israel, Israelites from the Philistines, if I remember correctly. And so, you know, he says to this boy, he said, just put my hands Put my hands on these pillars. Then he says to God, you know, and paraphrasing, oh, God, I'm sorry. And just let me do this one last thing. And that strength comes back and he's able to push those pillars and the whole place collapses. And all of those Philistines, all those leaders, all died. The Bible said he killed more in his last act than he did throughout his entire life. In the end, he still fulfilled his destiny. You might have blown it. But God will still make a way. Now, hopefully it doesn't end up with you being dead in a pile of rocks, but you understand what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, God will still make a way, man. He will make a way. All right, well, Mark chapter 9. I'll mention another story, since I'm the, and this is a little different, but in Joshua 21, there was a war between the tribes of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin really lost. And they had, the other tribes had, that were fighting against them had made a vow that we will not give our daughters to the tribe of Benjamin. And then when the war was ended, man, the battle was ended, and the tribe of Benjamin was wiped out, and there were no women for them to have. There was just a few people left. And then all of a sudden, the people of Israel were upset. Oh, my goodness, we wiped out an entire tribe. You know, what are we going to do now that the tribe of Benjamin can at least continue to exist? Somebody comes up with an idea. Well, you know, there's a feast of the Lord over there. And the women are going to come out and dance and dances. So tell those guys, those Benjamites, uh, to, to go over to the feast. Hide in the bushes. And when the women come out to dance, catch one and run home. And you, we've talked about it before. I, I can't wait to get to heaven to see this. I think this is going to be one of the funniest <laughs> scenes ever. This big brute chasing some woman down. She had no idea. She out here to worship God. She dancing before the Lord. And she turned around and there goes Bubba. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and then we find out how fast she can run, you know. And the Bible says that they, they grabbed him. They ran home with him. And then the fathers came. Hey, man, what's going on? He's got, you know, and they said, listen, you didn't give her away. So you're not guilty of breaking the vow. Amen. We had to let this happen so that the tribe of Benjamin could continue. Amen. When there was no way, God made a way. <laughs> you might be saying, I've been single for too long. You better, you better be careful what you're asking for. You might have a big bubble chasing you. No, I'm just kidding. You may say, there's no way I could get married. Huh? God will make a way. Mark chapter 9. I've seen that in my own family. My sister married a man from London. Really, Milton Keynes, England. I mean, who would have ever thought that? God has a way of doing that, man. You, you, you're thinking here, and we've talked about this before, and God brings something out of left field. So don't just, you just got to do what we're about to say, what we're about to see here. 
It comes down to something we're very familiar with, but we've got to, we've got to do. We just have to do it. You just have to do it. Mark chapter 9 and verse, let's do verse 14. When he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, what question you with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. So this man has a son who's possessed with a demon spirit, and you can see what the demon spirit does to him. Foaming, gnashing with his teeth, and of course, finding way. He's sicker, and he's getting sicker and sicker and sicker. Jesus answered, saith unto him, uh, answered him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him straightway, the spirit tear him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. This looks bad. Right? The spirit, they did bring the boy to Jesus. And, and of course, just when you seem to be at the point of breakthrough, things just seem to just fall apart. Has anybody experienced that? Anybody experiencing that right now? I am. Just when you're right there, then you're like, okay, well, the Lord's about to, what in the world is going on? <laughs> Things just get to a whole, go to a whole nother level. And, and this boy is falling out and foaming and wallowing and all the other stuff. And Jesus, I love his response. He was just so cool. He asked his father, how long is it ago since this came in? When did this start? This boy on the ground wallowing and foaming and all this other stuff, right? Making, and Jesus like, hey, when did this start? <laughs> He's not worried about it all. You might as well not be worried either. He's not looking at your problem saying, oh, I'm worried about that one. <laughs> He's not worried about it. We got to be careful. You know, we got to have the right mentality. I, I love, I think how Jesse Duplantis talks about that in Genesis chapter 1 where it said that, you know, darkness was on the, the face of the deep. God didn't walk in and just say, boy, it's dark in here. <laughs> he said, light be. Yeah. You know, we got to have the same mentality. We can't look at the negative. We got to go ahead and focus on what God said and believe. And speak what God said. So, of course, the father says, of a child, and oft times it have cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, he's not even sure if Jesus can do anything now. His disciples couldn't do it. He's not even sure if Jesus has the ability. But he's saying, if you can, have compassion on us and help us. Very interesting have compassion on us. I mean, he's, he's pulling the heartstrings. But he didn't need to. And that's one of the things we got to get out of this. Jesus said to him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believe it. See, compassion is a given. Too many times we end up in situations where we feel like God doesn't love me. If you really cared about it, God you really cared about me, you'd fix this. We try to pull on his heartstrings. When you forget that he so loved you that he gave his only begotten son, allowed him to be beaten and whipped, crucified, and dragged into hell for you when you were his enemy. And the Bible says if he gave us Jesus, how much more will he give us all things? The Bible talks about how a father will give a child what they ask for just because of a natural love. How much more would your heavenly father give you what you ask for? The problem isn't, does God care? The problem isn't, does God love you? God cares about you. God knows every hair on your head. He keeps count of that. God cares about what happens to you. God loves you more than you even understand with your brilliant brain. The question isn't God's love. The question is, do you believe? Jesus says, if you, the man says, if you can do anything, have compassion. Jesus says, if you can believe. It's not about if I can do anything. You know I can do it. It's not about if I love you. You know I love you. The question is, will you believe me? Because the way this works is you must believe.
If you came to my house tomorrow and you walked in the house and then you realized that your cell phone was dead. Well, no matter how upset you might get about it, you might cry. I might feel for you. You know how we are about our cell phones now. You can almost steal my car, just don't steal my phone, you know. I, mean, <laughs> I got insurance on the car and the phone, though, you know. But no matter how, how much I, you felt, you, how bad you felt, how much I felt for you, nothing we would ever do could change that until you plug it in. You got to plug it in. If I said I got a charger right here, plug it in and you, oh, but you, you don't care. And you get it. You know, I'll be looking at you. Plug it in. And I think that's really what God's looking at. We're saying, oh, God, why not this and that? And, that? and God's like, plug it in. Just believe. If you believe, all things are possible. You can get all the power that you need to heal your body and bring your marriage together and get your kids right and get your career on. You can get whatever you need. All things are possible. But you got to believe. You must believe. It's just simply the law of this universe. And we know enough not to argue with laws. We don't, get, we don't throw a fit over gravity. Nobody, uh, nobody has a fit about gravity. Why? We understand it's a law. I don't care who you are, how smart you are, how much money you have, what color you are, what your background is. You jump off this building, you are going down. It's a law. It works every time. And we forget faith is the same way. It is a law. If you do not believe, you will not receive. If you do believe, you will receive. And when it's all said and done and you're chasing the dream God has for you, you've got to believe. You've got to get to the place where you're saying, God, I am not moved by what I see or what I feel or by what, what obstacles are in my way. I believe God. I believe you will make a way where there is no way. I believe you, God. You must believe. The thing we got to do, we got to remember about faith is that developing faith is not a mental process. You develop faith. You, faith comes by taking heed to the word of God with your heart. And so when we talk about even developing faith, too often we shift into learning mode. Well, I heard this message, and I read this scripture, and I, I learned this, and I learned that. You don't learn faith. Not, not in the way I'm talking about. You can learn about faith, but you don't learn. It's not, it's not, it's not taught. It's caught. And it's only caught when you spend enough time in God's word concerning that area that on the inside, the light comes on. On the inside, you, you found yourself as hard as a rock. You, I believe, man. It, it, that, that it's, it's caught. And where some of us have been missing it is that we've been trying to use faith when we don't have faith for that area yet. Because we tried to learn it. And we didn't take enough time to catch it. But if you're going to have victory, you got to listen to messages like this is why God had me deliver this message to, to help you to catch it. Because it's different when you have faith. It's of the heart. It, 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 it's, it, it's, it's an entirely different experience than when I, I, I figured it out. I learned it. When you learn things, you might have a test on paper. When you catch faith, you have a test in life. So what you've got to do if you find yourself wavering, struggling, hurting, you know, don't, you know while, while you're in the middle of this battle, while you're, you know, you're looking at this obstacle and you just see a, a Goliath, you just see a wall, man, you just see a wilderness, and, and, and you're having a hard time believing. You're saying, God, don't you have compassion? If you can do anything, if that's where you are, then you need to immerse yourself in God's word and remind yourself 
who you're talking about, what he can do. And do it until you get to the place where you are fully convinced that he will make a way. And when you're at that place where you got crazy faith, you walking on water, and you out there on the battlefield with a slingshot about to throw it at this giant. Come on, that's, that's, that's faith. When people ask you about something, and you go, that, no, I'm not sick. But you, 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 I'm not sick. But you're broke. I'm not broke. I'm dead free. Who are you talking to? I'm, I'm not broke. Who am? him? But you're divorced. I know, no, no, God restored my marriage. You see, when you went to see, that, that doesn't, you can't put that on. That's where we get in trouble. We put it on. Now, partly because it does help to say it. It helps build your faith for you to confess the right things. And, you know, you have to watch your mouth. And, but but, but it's, it's an automatic response to the word of God. Faith is. It's an automatic response. When you got it in here, you can't help but have it coming out of here. If you're having to push it out, you're not there yet. Because when it's there, it's just going to come out. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And that's what you got to do. You got to get to that place where you believe, baby. And when you believe, all things are possible. Watch out. God is going to make a way in the wilderness. He's going to make rivers in the desert. He will make a way. Does anybody believe that? Yeah. Yeah. He will make a way. And then you'll find yourself in that place where you're going to have to shout at the walls. Where you're going to have to, when God told Moses, lift up your rod in front of everybody. And part the sea. That place where you're given a shout of faith and you're... You're acting in faith and 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 because you gotta you gotta work with him like that. And some of us that may be where you are right now as well. You believe, but you you just you just need to find a way to act on it. And God to tell you what to do. But a lot of times it's just as simple as lifting your hands and giving God praise and glory and thanking him that you have the victory and just just shouting at the shouting at your wall and saying, You're down, baby, you're down. Sickness, you're down. Poverty, you're down. Depression, you're down. I am free. So stand on your feet right now if you would. Let's lift our hands toward heaven even now. Even if it's just you're doing it because you choose to accept the word that you heard today. And just begin to thank God. Thank him that you got the victory. Thank him that he will make a way.